So we wish our opponent, uh, we say hi, we say good luck. Because that's what we do at the start of chess games. Since we can't do a handshake online, now can we? Are we all ready? Um, I have to admit, I did not overly prepare for this match. But we're going to stick with Old Faithful. Got the English. English has been my over-the-board tournament opening, so I will stick with it for this ladder. Until somebody refutes it. I do appreciate that this ladder's a little bit quicker than the last one. Um, toward the beginning of the previous ladder, uh, one of my motives or motivations had been to try to get some quick games done. Um, because, well, frankly, it's much easier to play a quick game. Um, it doesn't require the immense time commitment that, say, a 45-45 or 60-30 or something of that nature requires. So here we are. I've played the English opening. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's C4, generally followed by E5 or C5, is recognized as the English. Um, its defining characteristic is that this pawn controls the center, and that black does not get to play D5. Um, and so here we are um, in the main line of the English. Uh, and I have to admit I'm a little confused because I'm not entirely familiar with this variation. Uh, I think I've seen this once before, and it's been told, people have told me that knight takes knight is actually better than it looks. So uh, it looks like all it does is just double some pawns, um, but I think this also helps um, strengthen white's control in the center, and this four versus three dynamic is not so easy for black. Um, now I have to choose, do I go into the endgame right away? Or do I say play bishop a3 or something of that nature? I think my bishop gets shut off sides if I play bishop a3. Um, this does bear some similarity to a Rui Lopez. This bears a lot of similarity in fact. Except I'm familiar with playing the black side of that opening. I don't think that's a problem, though. So the only problem here is that I could use one more tempo for development. If I could just say play bishop g5 and e4 all in the same move, then I would be very happy with this position. Um, just because my attack will go quickly if I do that. Actually, I wonder... Yeah, so generally in a Rui Lopez, um, well, I, I'm just trying to imagine, can my king make it to c2, and can I get something that, no, that, that, that doesn't quite work out. Um, I'm just trying to imagine, what can I do that would look like that which I'm familiar with? And I don't think that I have many options in the realm of what's familiar. Um, so I'm going to pin this knight. Wait, if I pin that, he takes my queen, I take back. Yeah, his knight's still pinned. So this is still good. Um, so the idea is, bishop g5, I'm going to double his pawns on f7 and f6. And even if he takes my queen, I'm still threatening to double his pawns. He'd have to follow with king e7, and that would give me time to play things like e4, um, or e3. Now perhaps I should have taken the queen, although I think that all transposes anyhow. Yeah, I think I should follow with e3 and move some piece, be it my queen or my bishop, to f3. Long term, my chances are with just some kind of kingside attack. Okay. See, now I get to double his pawns um, 
and contrast this with my C pawns. I think this is really strong for me. Um, because here, um, it's it's just very difficult for black to, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm optimistic about this four on three and less optimistic about these doubled pawns being able to run against um, my pawns that are set up to bear a blockade against them. Uh, I'm just optimistic about my chances here. And so if I play g3, he does bishop e4, I have to do f3. I don't think I want to go there. Um, if I do e3, he does bishop e4, again I'm forced to do f3. Yeah, g3 is not so bad. Normally f3 is terrible, but here it seems okay somehow. This pawn controlling d3 is actually quite useful. Black's going to castle, and um, this castle structure here, I don't know, it looks quite good for, or it looks quite safe for black. Uh, yes, I'm going to push this pawn, I think. I'm just I'm trying to balance all the needs of all my pieces in this position, and it's tricky to do so. There's a lot going on. Oh, if he does, if I do e3 and he does bishop d3, I'm not compelled to take the bishop. That's a key point. So, uh, for example, I could do e3. He might do rook g8 instead of castling. Um, and that just forces his king to stay in the center a little bit longer. But if I do e3 and he does bishop d3, I absolutely do not take it. Um, The only thing I'm really concerned about is if he can like move his king out of the way and double rooks quickly and play rook d2, and then rook b2 and the other rook to d2. If he can accomplish all that in the time it takes me to develop, then I've failed at developing. Um, but I don't think he can do that. I don't think he has time for all of that. Oh, the other thing to be concerned about is, to say, if he steps his king over to c8 and plays rook e8 and manages to pile down on this pawn in the center. Um, again, that'd be kind of disastrous. Okay, so I think e3 is a good developing move. It protects my pawn on c4 against something like bishop e6. It protects the c3, or d3 square. And if he does put his bishop on d3, I can just attack the bishop with rook d1. And we trade down, and I have still a favorable endgame. So I'm kind of liking this. Um. Alright, so time to see if anybody's tuned in to watch it all. I should have thought about this before I set up, or before I started running the stream. Um, but you know, we'll we'll take things as they go. Oh, could I move my phone a bit away from the mic? I don't know exactly what you're talking about here. Um, because I don't have a phone that's operating right now. But I'll move some things around, and if there's some issue, I guess maybe that'll help. Um, for sure there are a lot of wires running around here. Um, yeah, let me listen for one second to see like if we're picking up any feedback or something of that nature. Oh, it's my move. He moved king e7. So my plan was just to try to get my bishop to e2 and rook to d1.
Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by having the phone near the mic. Um, I'm listening in on the stream and I don't hear anything that sounds like a phone. Now, it is unfortunate that this bishop uh, covers b1 over here. So that's um, one point not in my favor. Um, but I think once I get my rook to d1, yeah, I'll be covered. Um, so I was mentioning this idea of playing um, f3, just grabbing some more space. Sure, it does put the pawn on the wrong color square, but it does grab more space, and I think that's quite useful in this position. Um, I have no bishop pair, unlike a Berlin, for example, and I have played the Berlin quite a bit, and that's why I keep going back to it. Um, so I have to choose between f3 and bishop f3. And I think um, bishop f3, he just plays bishop d3, and I have to go back. Or I ha or he just trades on f3 and doubles my pawns, and I'm not sure how good that is for me. Like, I was optimistic about this position um, with my bishop where it's located right now. Yeah, I'm going to grab some more space. And I could follow up potentially with g4, and I don't know at what pace the h-pawn is going to move. But I fully expect that he's going to counter with bishop d3, to which I can counter his counter with rook d1. Okay, so we've sidestepped all that, and he's just played bishop c2 directly. Um, this does control the d1 square. But, I mean, there's got to be some way I can exploit this bishop here, right? I could play rook c1 to develop my rook. He probably goes back bishop to a4. Or do I do bishop d1 here? No, there's no sense in doing bishop d1, because even if everything trades off, that's not a desirable... I mean, it might work, but... Um... That's not a goal of this position. I really am attached to this idea of liquidating with him playing bishop d3. And that's why I keep going back to that. Um, I think rook to c1 improves upon this bishop d1, bishop d e2 thing. Um... Actually, no, it doesn't. Well, I mean, it, it would... So, once this bishop goes off to a4, supposing it goes there... I mean, I'm, I'm supposing a lot, because if, like, if I play bishop d1 right now, he could just go back to g6 or something. And what have I accomplished, other than hemming in my pieces? Um... Yeah, I'm going to try to see if he plays, like, bishop a4 here. Um, rather, let's get the other color out for his pieces. I'm going to see if he tries to play that and control this. And if he does, I could play bishop d1 and force a trade. Um, another option he's got is bishop g6. And against this, I'm not entirely sure what to do. Maybe I still do bishop d1 anyway, and then follow it with bishop c... Or, hang on. Follow this with um, bishop to c2. I know that he's going to play rook g8 at some point, and I'm going to be forced to play... Um, no, not pawn... Here we go, pawn g3. What if I play a4? That's an interesting thought. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, 
yeah, there's a lot of things going on. I think um, I have more space than my opponent. My opponent has more time on the clock than I have. I'm not too concerned about that. Let's see, let's make sure this isn't too loud. Alright, so bishop f5. He plays the one thing I didn't suggest. And so, like, bishop f5, the difference is that he can go back to e6 if I attack the bishop. Um, but I don't have any need to attack it right now. I just want to control the d-file. Possibly the b-file, but definitely the d-file want, I want to control. Um, so, with that said, I think I have to play rook d1 here. And he could trade rooks, and I could play king takes, and then king c1. Um... Yeah, I need to get my rook on an open file. It's not clear where my other rook goes, it's not clear where all my pawns go, but I do need to prevent rook d2. So since I've prevented this, um, and the point of this would be that he could either like take on a2, or even if I guard a2, he could just move rook, um, rook b2, and then get his other rook and repeat this process and have two rooks on my second row. Um, which I'm just not going to allow. So that's why I shuffle like this. He might try to repeat the position. I don't know. If he does, I guess I just lift my rook and say there's no repetition. Yeah. So I know right now I've got a number of pawns on light squares, and ideally... Um, this is not something that white wants to be doing. Uh, but on the flip side of that, I've got all kinds of space under my control also. Um, and so I'm just going to focus on peace activity. I need to get my other rook active. And if he confronts me on this file, I need to offer a trade on a square where it's useful um, for the trade to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, I used uh, CSS to uh, adjust this layout. In fact, um, yeah, here you can go to that site. Uh, it's a user style that gets applied on top of LeechS. In my opinion, this makes things um, stand out a lot more. So it's easier to read, in my opinion. Some people might not like it, but I think it, for my use, I found it a lot easier to um, see where, just to read the text and read things that really stand out. Like uh, here, the usernames are highlighted in a really bright color and outlined. Um, the clock is really pronounced. I think it is in the normal style as well. Um, but also I can like see the moves and I'm not so interested in can, things like where it says talk in chat or at the bottom where you might not even be able to see this but previous results. Um, so some of these things that I don't want as pronounced I'm able to hide away a little bit. Well, I don't know. Like, you could say that theoretically sharing thoughts might put a player at a disadvantage because they're spending some effort doing that. But I think since we traded into an endgame so early, we have ample time on the clock. A 10 second increment means that I've got more than enough time to think um, and should not be under serious time pressure this game. So I think um, my opponent has given me a single weakness, which is this pawn on c4. And sure, I will need to do something about that, but I'm not alarmed or anything of that nature.
Okay, so I think I still have to play rook d1. This, again, this isn't a bad position for white. I have a single weakness on c4, but I don't think it's going to be a big problem. We'll see over time if I'm right or wrong, but I think for now, this looks pretty good. Um, so the only really serious alternative to rook d1 would be something that would prevent against like bishop d3, uh, followed by we trade bishops and his rook forks my pawns. So I have to deal with that threat somehow. One thing I don't want to do is play pawn e4, because that would commit one of my pawns to a light square for a very long duration. Um, I don't want to play that, but maybe I'm forced to. But I'm probably not. Um, all these pawns are flexible. So like my a pawn and g and f can move and get off of light colored squares. Um, and yeah, my rook is less useful than my opponent's rook, so I should not be afraid to trade it. Ideally, I would have had my rook on d5 by now. And sure, that is a light square, but I think that would be a good place to trade. Um, because that would undouble my pawns, and I'd have a really strong, or a really large pawn center that my king could walk behind um, and push my opponent around a little bit. So the question is, if he takes on d1, do I do bishop takes or do I do king takes? I guess king takes makes sense. Um, the only reason to not play king takes is because currently my king protects this b1 square. And if I'm somehow concerned that his bishop might end up making use of that square and actually being effective, uh, that would be an argument toward taking with the bishop. Um, or in favor of taking with the bishop. The other thing is that I guess bishop takes allows me to play bishop c2, which is one tempo faster than playing um, king takes and then king d2 and then bishop d3. Again, um, because this is a bishop and pawn endgame, um, I don't think tempi are as important as they are, say, in a rook and pawn endgame. So I don't think that time is really of the essence here. It's more, or tempi, I don't think are very essential to this. It's more important to set up the correct formation in this kind of endgame than it is to try to um, attack quickly. And games are tricky like that, because some of them you will need to, um, you do need to attack very quickly. But here, this position is really congested. I mean, it looks like an open position, but, um, pieces just don't have much mobility at all. Well, okay, so I do see a way that my opponent could try to break away. He could play, like, c6, a6, b5. And try to orchestrate a way to break up my doubled pawns that are barricaded his doubled pawns. I don't think that's going to happen. So, yeah, I'm going to follow with king d2, bishop d3. And say if he plays bishop b1... Um, yeah, I didn't think he was going to play bishop b1 at all. Okay, I gotta get my king toward the center. Getting my bishop on d3 helps me advance my king a little bit further. Or at least it kicks this bishop away. And so the question is, can these doubled pawns here, uh, c7 and c5, um, find their way to make a passed pawn? I don't think black can easily make a passed pawn here. All right, so we're going to play a3. This is, again, a possibility I was trying to get to and explain and just didn't really get to. Um, but, yeah, this bishop on b1 is not very effective. And the reason it's not effective is because, like, now I can follow with bishop d3 
and his options are to trade out bishops or to play bishop a2. And if he plays bishop a2, there's the possibility um, that his bishop might get trapped. So bishop a2, like, bishops don't belong in the corner, is basically the point here. And sure, I have more pawns on light, well, I had more pawns on light squares than he had until this last move, and now we're even. And that's just going back to my point earlier about um, mobile pawns not being locked on a color complex. Um, so yeah, bishop b1 was a wasted tempo because he forced me to put my pawn onto a dark square, which is not something he wanted to do. Now maybe what he's saying with bishop b1 is that he wants to trade bishops and he wants to just go into a pure king and pawn endgame. I don't know if he's saying that or not. Um, but if that's what he's saying, that's an interesting statement. Oh, well, look at this. So when you're trying to break through with pawns, you, you don't want to push the one that's blocked. Like this pawn blocks this pawn. And doubly so here, both of those pawns are blocked by both of these. And so pushing a6 makes it much harder to get this essential b5 break in. Um, so the only question on my mind here is do, do I play a4 to permanently stop b5? I think a4 is a, is a mistake here, and I think the reason it's a mistake is because his bishop can go back um, and hit my pawn that stands on a4. So actually I shouldn't be pushing on this side of the board at all. Uh, I should be pushing on the king side. Alternatively, maybe I can try to trap his bishop. Actually, that works really well. So, yeah, this is the... Okay, strategically, he's one tempo up on me here because he got to play a5 faster than I got my pawns moving. And I was trying to find, like, okay, what do I do strategically in reply? Because if I just push h4, I'm really not that close to promoting. And the justification um, for my whole strategy here is that uh, his bishop's trapped. This is too good to be true that black is just breaking through on the queen side. Like, if I were to play bishop d3 and we traded bishops and he plays king c6 and b5, I'm sorry, if we trade bishops and he plays a4, then c6 and b5, that's really hard for me to stop. And yet, I don't think I made any blunder to throw the game. Um, so the answer to all of that is that e4 just traps his bishop. And so, yes, I have made no blunder here. I haven't really thrown the game, and this is how I managed to save the game here. Um, otherwise, these pawns run a little quickly. Like, earlier I was saying I don't think that Tempi are very important in this endgame. Um, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So he plays this predictable f5. Um... Obviously, uh, he didn't calculate this, and so now he's just giving up the f-pawn. Actually, this bishop's trapped, too. Still trapped. Um, see, I was saying that pawn races tend not to be very important, um, because it's really hard to make a breakthrough when you have doubled pawns here and blocked pawns here. And usually the bishop can trade off for an extra pawn and everything just settles itself, sorts itself out somehow. Um, but here my opponent went for the most aggressive possible continuation. And it just tactically doesn't work. So now he's forced, I think, to play bishop takes pawn and try to justify what he did. He gets two pawns for the bishop but I don't think that's going to be enough.
But yeah, I think had he played less aggressive moves, like had he not played bishop b1 and pushed a5, with with these moves he's trying to promote as quickly as possible. And this is just more than the position allows him to do. Um... So, maybe this even goes a little back to Zug's point that he was raising um, yesterday when critiquing my previous game. He was saying that you have to have some confidence in just your um, starting position, having some um, defensive potential in it. Like, you've got to believe that you're able to hold these positions together to some extent. And, like... If I could back up, I don't know if I can show what I was analyzing like while the game's in progress, but I was foreseeing a bishop trade and, and just seeing him push all of his pawns and mine being much slower, my king being all the way back on d2 compared to his d6, um, and his king just being better positioned to stop all my pawns. Um, Okay, so this king's not going to be able to break through over there. Yeah, I just need to centralize my king. But yeah, I, uh, in all these variations I was imagining that he would promote faster than I would. And it wasn't even close. And that didn't make sense, because I hadn't blundered this game. I hadn't done anything to throw away uh, the draw. Okay, so I've anchored this pawn, both of these, on light squares. Um, I could even follow with g4 here. I'm not sure if g4 is best, but it does break up this pawn duo. But then I'm left with an h pawn to try to promote. On the other hand, if I don't break up this pawn duo, my bishop's not able to go anywhere. So, yeah, here we are, g4. This breaks up the pawn duo, exploits the fact that his king no longer guards uh, the f4 square, and prevents black from playing, say, h5. I can't change colors in the middle of a drag and drop thing. Uh, there we go. So, yeah. Okay, so we just trade pawns here. I have to take this one, because otherwise the h-pawn backs it up. And now I'll watch this billiard shot. So here I'm hitting this b-pawn. But the b-pawn's not the real target. You know where the target is? So I've gone bishop from e2 to g4. Um, black controls these squares, so I can't really... Um, use those squares just yet. And if I go over here, I'm sorry, if I go there, he already controls this square. The real target of this bishop move is this pawn over here. So I'm doing this nice little billiard shot, bishop to g4, to c8, to b7, for the purpose of snatching the e4 pawn. Um, but also stopping black from playing pawn c6 and b5 and all that stuff. So we got another pawn. All is well with the world at the moment. Okay. So the question is, how do you win this endgame, right? And um, I'll just stress yet again, it's important that white uses pieces. Um, so maybe I have to push h4 here to zugzwang him? I don't think so. Um, one thing I don't want to see is pawn c6. But if pawn c6 happens, I can go back and munch the pawn. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to allow pawn c6 just this turn. If he plays pawn c6, I just go back and take it. Um, but if he doesn't move a pawn, then he's moving his king. 
And if his king moves, then my king can go forward a little bit more. Now, yes, I do want to get my pawn, my king over to take his h pawn. Um, that's a little tricky to negotiate at the moment. Let's see. Yeah, I need to keep his king out of f6. I was considering moving my bishop back to c8 to permanently, like, to try to stop this thing. I couldn't stop it. I tried. Um, but still, this is hard for black to break through. And if he pushes b5... Actually, he's only got one pawn supporting b5, so if I have two preventing it, I'll be okay. Actually, I don't need to push that at all. This pawn adequately guards b4. And if he pushes b5, he's going to be forced to capture back with his c-pawn, and then my king just walks over here. So I'm going to play this, because I just don't have a better move. Alright, so yeah, as predicted... Oh, hang on. I've got to be a little bit careful. Um... One thing that just occurred to me is that this pawn is on the same color square as the bishop. So if all the pawns liquidate, I'm not necessarily winning that. In fact, I'm probably not. Um, Alright, so we're going to do something a little imaginative here. He's going to push b4. Sorry. Do you guys like to see the red arrows, I think, for his moves? He's going to push b4, I push a4, and all his pawns... Um, well, I would make a claim that he's blockaded and can't do anything. I don't know how true that is. But this advanced pawn at least at the moment, isn't threatening to do anything. I just want to avoid trading all the pawns, but actually my c-pawn here can't get traded. Um, he has no, no pawn he can attack it with. So I don't need to be afraid of trading... Well, yeah, let's trade this c-pawn for that c... or the b-pawn. He's going to do c-takes, because he doesn't want to give me a passed pawn out here. And, yeah, all I have to make sure is that, one, he doesn't promote, and two, um... Well, two, we don't trade off everything except this h-pawn. So I've been taking this endgame seriously. I might not have calculated everything correctly, but I am doing my best to try to maximize my winning chances. Alright, so he takes there. And like I said, I want to avoid trading pawns in this case. Um, because if we trade off all the pawns, I might not be able to promote a pawn um, like, if somehow my A and C pawns get traded, this is a draw. So I have to keep at least one of these two. Yeah, that's the fun part of if everybody playing in the ladder streams at the same time, which I don't think everybody streaming is playing in the ladder, but I think um, it definitely shows off Lee Chess's prowess in this domain. Um, of online chess and lets everybody know that Lee Chess is the place to be. Alright, so hang on, we're gonna barricade this C pawn and allow my bishop to transfer over to this diagonal. My opponent's I mean, yes he could play B3, but that my king goes back and takes it. Um so now, these squares are under control um, by my pawn and my bishop, as well as the b3 square. So now I can just muscle my way over here. 
I could probably even Zugzwang him out and win the C pawn. Um, oh, he's not going to C7 because he thinks, yeah, that's a little too simple. Um, let's see, can I check him? Now if I check him, he just goes back to D7. That's one useless looking check. Um, All right, well, we're going to take the H-pawn. But I'm not allowing his king over here. So this is all still barricaded. I still have all this barricaded. His king's still locked in. Okay, he's trying to do something sneaky in the corner. But you know why I took that h-pawn? It wasn't so I could promote. It was so that his king is stuck now on the h-file. He's got to take care of this pawn, right? And while he's taking care of that pawn, I just go ahead and promote a different one. It might not be the fastest way to win, but it's by far one of the simpler ways to do it. I guess the other simple way to do it was go take the c-pawn and then while he's busy trying to stop my other c pawn, while he's trying to stop c5, then I go over to the king side and take the h pawn. It's the same principle, but yeah, maybe I could have promoted the c pawn. Who knows? Um, but yeah, to point out just one thing. So during the game, I was analyzing does this bishop on b1 really help black attack? Like if I had just played bishop to here and we trade. This is what I was concerned about, is that he, now he would play um, c6, and supposing I didn't have this move a4 to try to complicate things somehow. I'm not even sure that a4 is best, but like you see here, my king is as far back as his, I guess, um, and it's just really difficult to break through. Ah, yes, Zaitsev! Zaitsev says this would not have happened if I had just played the Zaitsev opening. You are correct, sir. Something different would have happened. But yeah, um, this endgame is not so simple for white. In fact, perhaps this is better for black. Um, on account of his king being well centralized and this pawn majority being a little more ready to race than mine are. Um, the one thing I have in my to my advantage here is that these pawns really defend each other well. But say if I'd done something super ambitious, like, I don't know, so I start with a4, because I have to. Um, or maybe a king move, I don't know. And say I do something crazy like h4, and how else could I mess this up? Um, say so I play f4, if I'm doing all the fours here and just letting his king wander in, um, this gets iffy. Well, one, because I pushed all the wrong pawns, I wouldn't have done that. See, I would have had to lead with g4, but his king's still a better place than mine is. Um, and I suspect something like this would have happened, and I can't take here, or if I do, um, we see something like this, and now his pawn's threatening to race down here. And mine, sure, mine is also threatening to race, but, um, I don't know. Actually, technically this is still to my advantage. He would have needed to have his king in a position to take this, uh, but anyhow, this is the kind of sort of thing I was concerned about where it's just difficult for white to make progress. Yeah, this doesn't quite work out for black because here I do play c4 and this is a passed pawn that's there permanently and converts to a permanent advantage and such, but this is the general idea I was kind of looking at. Um, I was worried about and didn't have time to calculate. Turns out I was worried about nothing, but I guess better safe than sorry there. And because of all these ideas, um, 
Black just suddenly spawned out of... Like, he got this amazing attack out of nowhere. It means I had the right to have some kind of counterattack somewhere. And so yeah, my counterattack uh, to this whole idea was I just played e4. And now his bishop really doesn't have a way out. So... Yeah, I'm not sure what Black does here. Maybe he had to play, like, King e5 and try to... I don't know. This is quite messy. Um, but maybe his king can hunt down my bishop in the same time that my king can hunt down his. Okay, we'll, we'll get the AI on here for just one second. Because um, I am curious. Okay, so... But what happens, say... I guess, yeah, there's nothing wrong with bishop a2. I could continue king c2. Um, oh, right, right, so he did have time for a4. But a4 would have locked his pawn onto a light square, and he wasn't ready to do that. But yeah, I could have forced him to play his pawn onto a4, and then maybe got a bishop trade under favorable circumstances. But this is the only way for his bishop to get out. I kept looking for this during the game, and I found like this bishop a2, pawn a4 idea, but I'd never found um, the way that black could find enough time to do it. And this answers the time question. You'd have to play it immediately before I attack the bishop. That makes sense. Alright. So, 